Welcome to This Week in Morgan County. I'm your host, Russell Mokhyber. Our guest this week is Pete Gordon. Pete Gordon is a longtime teacher in the Morgan County Public Schools, now retired, running for school board. He'll be on the ballot May 10th on the Morgan County primary ballot. It's a nonpartisan election. That means if you're Republican, Democrat, Independent, you get to vote in this election. And it's going to be Pete Gordon against Beth Michael in District 2 for the Morgan County School Board. Pete, welcome to the show. Russell, nice to be here. Nice to be here. Now, you're well known in the county. Uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of students have taken your classes. Math, you taught. Mm -hmm. uh, people want to know a little bit more about you. Where were you born? I was born in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, in what the, was, in the what Berkshires. Was, what was the work of your parents? My father was a research chemist. My mother was a music teacher. And uh, my father's work took him to, well, all over the country, all, all across the country. He lived everywhere. And, and what brought you to Morgan County? Uh, music brought me to Morgan County. I, I moved here to join Critton Hollis String Band, my friends Sam and Joe Herman, and uh, my best friend from up in Boston, Joe Fallon, who had moved here. And the four of us were Critton Hollis String Band back, back in the 80s. How long did you play with them? Uh, about eight years, although we still play. We still perform concerts here and there, but actively for eight years. When did you become a teacher? Uh, when I, I left the band in 1988 and went back to Shepherd University, which was college at that point, to get my teaching certification. And I've taught in Morgan County Schools since 1991. Retired in, in 2014. How many, how many students do you think you had over that period? Thousands. So uh, no, I probably, I'd say probably 1,500 to 1,800 students. So if only a percentage of them voted for you on May 10th, you'd win the election uh, going away. I think I'd, I'd be in. And if they have better memories than not in my classroom, I would encourage them to do so. What did you teach? Uh, I taught every le level of mathematics. Uh, I was determined to teach in Morgan County Schools. I didn't want to go to Maryland. Uh, I wanted to stay here. When I got my certification, the opening was in the sixth grade, so I taught sixth grade math at Whit Widmeyer Elementary. Uh, and glad that I did that. Very happy that I did that because it allowed an insight into the developing mind, let's say, of the younger person. Uh, I moved to the middle school when it was built and uh, back in 2002, I came up to the high school to do what I always, always wanted to do, which is to teach calculus. And I've taught every level at Berkeley Springs High School. How long were you at the high school? Uh, Twelve years. Why did you decide to retire? Because a lot of, I mean, your students, and one of my, one of my sons was one of your students, mm -hmm. uh, they rave about your teaching and uh, you as a teacher, um, and you were an asset to the school. Why did you decide to retire? Uh, I decided, Russell, to retire because I, I believe there comes a time when uh, uh, you need to pass on the, the daily responsibilities to energetic younger people. And uh, though I told my students every year that I was 25 years old, I was 25 years old many, many, many years. I'm, I'm actually a little bit older than that. And uh, there came a time to retire from the day to day. And I, people ask, do I miss it? In a way, yes, I do. I don't miss the daily 530 alarm. Uh, I miss the young people, and so I volunteer in the schools. I stay, I'm staying in touch with the schools. Um, but I decided to retire because there comes a time to devote your life to other things. What were some of the problems um, that you saw in the schools? Um, one of the things that a lot of people complain about is testing, no child left behind, pressure on teachers. Um, were those problems for you? And if not, what were some of the problems you saw in the, in the local schools? Well, as far as the testing goes, and No Child Left Behind, I feel that there is an overemphasis on standardized testing uh, that takes away what I call the educational environment of the classroom. More and more emphasis on testing. For instance, at Berkeley Springs High School, the whole last nine weeks, the the fourth nine weeks of the school year is devoted to testing and it clears out the media center because they test on computers now. So teachers can't get into the media center for students to learn. And I think testing is really of limited use in assessing. I've had 
dozens if not hundreds of students that I've seen in front of my eyes come in to take the test and just jot down a few answers, maybe even put their heads down because it means nothing to them. I don't think that the, that the standardized test adequately assess what's really going on. I think the test questions are pitched in a particular way that might not be the way that the students were taught. So in a nutshell, I don't think that these, t I don't think that these tests really show what the students know and what they don't know. It shows how well they are capable of testing on one certain day, you know, just a snapshot. When I say one day, I mean students go into the computer lab and they rotate, uh, but they're in there for one day for mathematics, one day for English, uh, one day for science, and it's just a snapshot. Maybe they had a bad night. Maybe they didn't get breakfast that day. Well, you know, testing is interesting because there has to be a way to judge whether a teacher is doing their job. Now, um, students universal, from my experience talking to students, they universally raved about your teaching. What do you think it was? How did you connect with students um, in the classroom? Uh, it boils down to respect and dignity, Russell. Uh, I was passionate about my teaching. I'm passionate about my students. I respected them. Never got angry in the classroom. If I had to talk to somebody, I, I would talk to them, uh, you know, some other place. I would call students out of the classroom to, to commend them for a good job. I'd call them out if I had to talk to them about something, you know, a behavior issue or whatever. Uh, but I respected my students. I treated them with dignity, and I think that they respected me in return. I uh, tried to take them by surprise before they took me by surprise. Um, and uh, I was passionate, or I am passionate about what I taught. And I think, uh, well, I, I taught mathematics, and I always answered the question, when am I gonna have to use this? How does this apply to the real world? I think in mathematics particularly, you need to show the students the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is that quite often you're learning things that won't really apply until years down the road. And you can't just sit there and say, well, be patient. You'll figure this out later on. I did a lot of hands-on stuff. There was a lot of action. I, had, I tried to get students moving around the class. I had them working in groups. I had them reporting. So it wasn't what I think no longer works in the classroom. My classes were not lecture, read the book, test, repeat, 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 repeat. Uh, I view teaching as a medium to get students to think for themselves. I happen to teach mathematics. You can do that in English, social studies, science, or whatever. My job was to get them thinking and if they're not thinking, if they're not willing to learn for themselves, I'm not going to help them much by just cramming stuff in. They're not going to learn it that way anyway. So I, I hope I answered your question. I, I had an active classroom. I trusted the students, respected them, let them teach themselves. Sure, I guided them. Didn't over-test them. Fun activities that show them the bigger picture of what mathematics really is, which is an art, by the way. But you don't see that until you get to the abstract. Did, um, how do you think the schools, the Morton County schools, could attract um, quality teachers like yourself and like others who've been at the, at the high school in, in Morgan County schools? Uh, Russell, I think we have attracted many, many good teachers. And Morgan County is a good place to learn how to teach. The problem is, over the years, we've gotten many teachers who've come here, spent a couple of years, and then, then they go away. Uh, Morgan County has been a very, very good place to teach. Now, I'm concerned about morale recently, just with funds going down. But uh, there is good support for the schools, from the school board, from the administration, from fellow teachers. Uh, I think if you walk into any of the schools, you'll find a good, healthy environment. You can kind of tell. It's much, much more than the teaching. If you walk into a school, you can just look around, look in the cafeteria, look in the library, look in classrooms. You can tell if students are happy, if they're satisfied, if they're learning. Not every student's going to be happy or learning. But uh, 
I think that the schools are here are a good place to learn how to teach. It's a good place for teachers. Problem is, if you look at Maryland and Pennsylvania and Virginia, salaries are 10,000, even $20,000, even more than that in some parts of Virginia. It's almost impossible for young people to stay here and to make a living. So we, and, and I'm running for school board simply because I want the best for our young people. I want the best schools possible. That involves keeping, attracting and keeping quality teachers. Uh, the funds draw a dismal picture right now, times to come. Well, funding is from the property tax base in Morgan County. Well, funding is it's from the property tax base in Morgan County, but the bulk of that goes to the state, and then the money comes back to us from the state formula. I don't think we get as much back from the state as we send to the state. Uh, the, the levy, 100% of the levy stays here, and that's that's on top of the uh, funding from the state. Uh, but the state, I mean, as far back in 1958, they, uh, they admitted that they did not have the funds to thoroughly and efficiently educate every student in West Virginia, and that's, so they allowed us to impose a levy on our citizens at that point. The funding primarily comes from the state, which comes from the property taxes. However, our property taxes go to the state, it's pooled there, it comes back according to the funding formula. One problem is that we've had, uh, we've had diminishing enrollment for the past three, four, or five years. And the formula is based on enrollment? Is based on enrollment, and so our funding has been going down. Not only that, but the state cut 1% cut across the board to education last fall. They're, coming, they're gonna cut again soon. They said, uh, and we, we don't know, I mean, we don't know for sure, but they said it's coming again in the spring. It's been said, it's been, let me just um, mm -hmm. tell you something I read this morning. It's been, a, an educator, Diane Ravitch, wrote that poor educational performance is correlated with poverty, not with bad teachers. Do you agree with that? And if that's true, what can be done about it? I would tend to agree with that. I, I think uh, in order to educate a child properly, you need good teachers, you need good schools, but you need families which also, which feed those children and instill values in those children. And, and what the families, generally speaking, what the families have done in the past is more and more the responsibility of the schools. Now we're, for instance, we're, we're giving free breakfasts and lunches to our children just to, to allow them to be uh, more fit in the classroom so that they will learn better. How can you learn on an empty stomach? Um, from, from your experience, mm -hmm. um, how severe is the problem of poverty in Morgan County? Well, what I hear and what I believe is that the poverty level is 70%. Now, I can't tell you exactly what that's based on, but I do know that we send home in Morgan County schools 350 backpacks. The backpack program uh, is a program in which students are given a backpack relatively anonymously in the schools. They take a backpack with enough food so that they can eat on the weekends. So we not only feed our student, students during the week, but we send them home. Now this is a volunteer program, uh, but we, we send them home with food for the weekends. You know, a lot of students don't see their parents that often. A lot of students don't get fed. Um, how, I, would you rate the, how would you rate the, I mean, if it's true that um, poor educational performance is correlated with poverty, and if it's true that poverty is 70%, how would you correlate, uh, how would you rate the public education here in Morgan County? How would I rate the education? I, I mean, would you say we have a, a strong educational system that educates its kids well? I would say yes. I would say yes to that, and I'll, I'll tell you why. I think we have a strong educational system, uh, and I think if students rise to the responsibility of completing their work and paying attention and thinking during this, the school day, that they have every potential. Uh, we send students to some of the best trade schools. Uh, we send uh, some, of the, some students to the best community colleges. I think back 
to my class of 2012. It was a star class. Your son Zane was in this class. In my one class, now it was calculus class. Students that came through Morgan County Schools in that one classroom went to Cornell, went to Virginia Tech, went to uh, Johns Hopkins, Dartmouth, uh, went to, let's see, West Point, mm -hmm. and I believe every college in West Virginia, this is one class of about 22 students, and I'm forgetting some, but just, we send students to some of the best technical schools. I believe that they are prepared for the workforce, if they choose that. Could we be better? Sure, we, we could be better. That's the, I think, the motivations, my motivation. Schools can always be better. Can we point to faults in our school system? Sure, we can point to faults in the school system. But I think uh, that we are generally preparing students for life and work after high school. One thing I should note is that I, I think the alternative school at Berkeley Springs High School is also very important. What, tell us about it. What is it? Well, the alternative school at Berkeley Springs High School has about 50 students who, generally speaking, do not work well in the general classroom. So they're separated from the general classroom, and these are students who ordinarily would just be expelled or go to after-school detention all the time, disrupt classes, and finally drop out. So they're separated, they're in a, in a program where they're given individual attention. Uh, Dr. Mike Wilder runs this program, along with Aaron Sorg, uh, who is a counselor at Berkeley Springs High School, and there are others involved in it. Uh, they work individually at their own level at the computer, but they have individual attention from Dr. Wilder and others, and they, they graduate from Berkeley Springs High School. They graduate, there's a separate graduation. They graduate, the, they'll graduate on Wednesday, I believe it's May 25th this year. And so they, they will get a diploma. They will have the chance to succeed with a high school diploma. Now, this is not just beneficial to those 50 students. This is beneficial to all the students in all the classes who would not have gotten as far, who would have been hindered with behavioral development or whatever. Uh, the alternative school also includes some tough cases who have come back from, well, incarceration or whatever. If, if they're not yet 18 years old, then we are required to educate them, and it, it's best that they be on their own. Uh, it's, it's a program that is just critical to the su success of our schools, I think. In the battle over Greenwood, one argument that was made was that, um, well, first of all, if money wasn't an option, mm -hmm. uh, if we had the money to keep Greenwood open, it would have been open. Oh, yes. How much money were we talking? Uh, to close Greenwood, I think, they said it was about four hundred eighty thousand dollars, something like and, that. And and had it kept open, it would have cut out programs like what you were talking about. The alternative. My school. fear is that it would it would have cut out alternative programs such as the alternative school, after school programs, the flex program. You know, people. We all see the advantage of small schools. I don't think anybody wanted to close Greenwood. Greenwood's a wonderful school. It's a, there, it's an advantage for a young person to go to a school where. They know everybody and, and get, get extra care, and it, it is like a family. Greenwood's a wonderful school, but I think, I'm afraid we got to a point where it was inevitable, and, uh, and people would disagree. People would say, no, you, there, there were other things to cut, but I'm afraid those things would have included the after-school program, free lunches and breakfasts, mm -hmm. the alternative school at the high school, things like that, which will be advantage to the Greenwood students later on down the line. And these anyway. battles are happening all over the country as uh, there's economic pressure on school districts mm -hmm. to uh, cut. But it's a little obscene to see, to go to wealthy communities like suburban areas around DC and see like, you know, state of the art, everything, small schools, state of the art, everything in small schools, the best mm -hmm. teachers, paying them well and so forth. One proposal to overcome this issue is to have uh, um, a national education tax, not base it locally on property and property values, so that every school district in the country gets relatively the same amount of uh, money for the school systems. Well, 
Shouldn't we also be pushing for that? And wouldn't that have relieved, for example, the battle over Greenwood if, like, we, if we actually had the money that other school systems had? Would you support that kind of system? Uh, Russell, I, I, would I support that kind of system? Yeah, if, we, if, we, if it means more money for our schools here, sure. I'd, I'd have to hear more about it. You know, as with any issue, there are pluses and minuses. But if you drive down 522 to Winchester and you look to the right, there's a new school when there's a, a massive new intermediate school being built back there. And I look at that and I think of our, our schools here. Our high school, our Berkeley Springs High School, I should say, and Paw Paw High School. The Berkeley Springs High School had a big renovation project and there are parts of Berkeley Spring high, Springs High School that look look beautiful, but other parts that are just falling down. Uh, you know, for instance, the, 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 the basketball court, the, you know, the, what they call the, the, uh, it's the C building, the C building. And I would love to get a beautiful new facility. Paw Paw needs loads of, loads of things. You know, we, we could use that. I don't know where it's, where it's going to come from. Funds are diminishing in the state. I think these cuts are going to keep going. If we could have a national, if we could have some piece of the pie that is giving Virginia this beautiful looks, I mean, it, it has to be a 60, 70 million dollar school being built right over the line. If we could get more to do, at least to adequately fund the schools that we have and give them renovations, I'd have to be for that until somebody tells me negatives. Negatives for, uh, you know, if we get this money and they tell us what to do, then that might be another story. There's a big um, homeschooling community in Morgan County. Mm -hmm. Our kids were homeschooled through high through right before high school. Um, what is your sense looking at? And this is a this is a big debate in in the country: homeschool versus you know public school and so forth. What is your sense about homeschoolers generally from the ones you've met? Oh, I, the ones I've met, I've met many of them because many of them have been in my classroom. I mean, I've had many many homeschool students who have come to me for math. Mm -hmm. I have many many friends who homeschool their students and. I, there's nothing wrong with that. I think, I mean, I think there's everything right with that for, uh, for individual cases. I think some people want to control, say, the education more. They, maybe they want the young people around more. They will go to a uh, top-notch curriculum, something like the, the Calvert curriculum out of Baltimore, which is a top-notch curriculum. You can homeschool, homeschool your children or whomever and have a teacher in Baltimore look over the work, so you, in, a, in essence, have a couple of teachers. I think that's good for some people. I think, you know, I, I think it's good for homeschool students to be able to take maybe a, some classes in the local public schools. Mm -hmm. I think it's important for them to have access to the public schools. Uh, I'm running for school board because most students won't do that or can't do that and I want our public schools to be best for, the best possible for all of the students. You, one of the ways you connect with kids is through your music. And so we've got just a couple minutes left. So take us out with, uh, tell us the story about the song that you're gonna sing us uh, and, and, and take us out with that. And here's your Okay, guitar. okay. Uh, well, excuse me, I'll, I'll uh, my back in range. Well, briefly, I've been involved at Warm Springs Intermediate School and in their recycling program, and they're doing a beautiful mural made of recycled plastic bottle caps. And I was asked, I, I'm, on, uh, I'm on the Solid Waste Authority, and I was asked if I would come in and answer questions about recycling. And I said, sure, but I also wrote down a song. And this song is very simple, but it requires some audience precipitation, okay? Now during this song, I say, I say, you say, don't throw it away, recycle every day. Now this song swept the intermediate school. So I say, don't throw it away, recycle every day. And you gotta sing it loud, here's how it goes. This morning to a beautiful day. My sister ate some cereal, then she threw the box away. My brother throws away everything he can find. We throw out six or seven bags of trash every time. I say, 
don't throw it away. Recycle every day. I say, don't throw it away. Recycle every day. Hey. Don't throw away that paper or that bottle or that jar. Don't throw away that cardboard or that plastic racing car. Don't throw away that bag. Don't throw away that can. You can take them on down to the recycle man. I say, don't throw it away. Recycle every day. Come on, Russell. Don't throw it away. Recycle every day. Just one more verse. <laughs> Well, there's garbage on the land and there's garbage in the sea. There's garbage on the road, it's everywhere around me. You know that it doesn't have to be that way. So please recycle, don't throw it away. I say, don't throw it away. Recycle every day. Come on, cameraman. I say, don't throw it away. Recycle every day. Thank you, Pete Gordon. Thank you, and thank you for watching This Week in Morgan County. <laughs>